Welcome to the Startup Grind. Our guest tonight, Zhang Li, is one of the most well-connected people here in Hong Kong in terms of the startup community, the entrepreneurial community. It's one of the first people that I met when I moved out here to Hong Kong, and Zhang is a great introducer. If you talk to Zhang for 30 seconds, he'll introduce you to five other people <laughs> that are great for you to know. Every time I go to an event, I talk to Zhang, and immediately he's saying, oh, you should talk to this guy, you should talk to this guy, you should talk to this guy. So. As soon as you start talking to John, he's going to greatly expand your network to a lot it's of other people. handing you off. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's just trying to get rid of me. No, huh? no, no. To get on to the meat of things, so uh, again, I met John about uh, nine months ago when I moved mm -hmm. to Hong Kong. He's been very helpful in my business, helping me get up and started. But uh, we're going to talk to him a little bit about his experiences and his background <laughs> and uh, his whole story here. So we're going to get off and running and started. We'll interview him for a while, and then we'll turn it open for Q&A from the audience. So if you have any questions, please uh, keep those questions ready in your mind, and at the end, we'll leave plenty of time for you to ask. Okay, so the first thing is, let's just go through the list of everything that you're involved in, wow, okay. which might take the rest you of the hour. Ready? But yeah. <laughs> Sure. So as of today, I am uh, my official full-time job is CEO of a very cool human robotics company called Hansen Robotics. So Hansen, Dr. Hansen uh, won the World Technology Award for hardware last year. I was one of the grand finalists for startmeup.hk last year. Um, unbelievably exciting company. Um, we, so I, in addition to that, we have a number of portfolio companies in Hong Kong. So we uh, have Hong Kong Commons, which is um, a, a peer co-work uh, startup community and uh, we have two campuses uh, we have a very different approach to that sort of thing we have a see a very cool little e-commerce site called lots of buttons which is the largest online retailer of buttons you know very cool Hong Kong company idea um, we are very active in social enterprise and education so we uh, have a, um, a, a suit company a bespoke suit company that we created to help uh, young people uh, work through drug rehabilitation and to have a uh, living, uh, to be able to, uh, despite a criminal record, a drug problem and no education, to be able to make real money in, indoors without breaking rock. Uh, we have about 13 other portfolio companies. Um, these days we've been, uh, I'm on the IP working committee for the Hong Kong government, uh, IP trading committee for the Hong Kong government, uh, and we work extensively with InvestHK. And we, we support great entrepreneurs like Josh. Do you sleep? It depends on the day. Yeah. But we're all entrepreneurs, right? Sleep's overrated, right? Yeah. No, really. I mean, I email you sometimes at 1 a.m. and you're like on it like that. See, and if you email me at 3 p.m., no response. Right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. That's, That's why I have to stay up to 1 a.m. 1 to 4, it's good, you know? Yeah. Yeah. We'll talk a little bit about your involvement with TEDx because sure. that's something oh, that's that right. everybody knows. Yeah, you didn't mention that sure, one. Sorry, so TEDx, yeah. Hong Kong, how did you get involved in that and what's the yes. story there? So uh, we just had one of our TED events, <coughs> TEDx events yesterday, uh, TEDx Live. Uh, we streamed uh, about an hour and a half of uh, actual TED uh, conference content from Vancouver, uh, including uh, half of the Snowden surprise video. Uh, interview, um, and we had some. We had four phenomenal speakers. Uh, we had over a thousand applicants. It was a free event. We had 300 people that that that, are, that we admitted in. Uh, I became involved with a good friend, uh, Gino Yu, who runs the uh, the multimedia pro master's degree in multimedia program at Hong Kong Poly University, and he's the actual original license holder for the TEDx Hong Kong uh, license. Um, great guy, um, he's, he's a, he's a, but he's a bleeding heart academic. He loves all that stuff. In a prior life, we owned MTV Japan, so I like things bigger. And so uh, I became a co-curator, uh, starting with TEDx Hong Kong 2012. And so uh, we do now TEDx Hong Kong, TEDx Hong Kong Education, and TEDx Hong Kong Live, these streams from the actual TED and TED Global Conferences. Uh, we have another one coming up. Uh, this is going to be the, the largest TEDx in Hong Kong yet, uh, at the Sunbeam Theater, uh, May 31st, TEDx Hong Kong Education. Uh, we have We've already confirmed a number of amazing speakers, including world-class neuroscientists, uh, an Academy Award-winning uh, computer animations robotics expert, uh, some really inspiring, you know, uh, special needs educators. 
and uh, you know, you guys are more than welcome. To, we would highly encourage you guys to to come. These are these. It's a very cool event. It's been really. Um, it's a very important part of what we do to try to help pull the community together. You know, and that's why we mix things: small events, free events. We try to keep the cost as low as possible, to, but to make them scale so that we can ex we can um, you know uh, multiply our impact. Mm -hmm. Great. MWI was a, was a <coughs> supporting organization at our, our last one in December. So let's back up a little bit. Let's go back into your history. Sure. Where do you come from? Where were you born? Where were you raised? What was the environment like? Sure. What, um, what made you into an entrepreneur? Wow, that's a great question. Um, I was born in Korea. I, I'm a 1.5er. I don't know if you know what that is. Uh, we landed in LA you know, uh, when I was four and a half years old. Apparently, the first thing I said in school was uh, apparently the first thing I did was laugh at the rest of my classmates because they didn't speak Korean. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, I grew up in LA, went to school out east, uh, swore to my father who, was a, who went to law school in Korea that I would do anything other than be a lawyer. But after working for a few years, sure enough, I went to Columbia Law School and became a buyout lawyer in New York and did that for four years. And then I started in venture capital three months after the internet bubble burst in Palo Alto, University and High Street. Uh, it was a back then a big fund. It was $700 million. They'd spent two thirds of it and most of it was written down. And mm -hmm. so as a venture guy who did a lot of LBO work, I ended up doing lots of turnarounds um, here and in Asia where you absolutely had to make very quick battlefield decisions and really try to figure out how to extract maximum value for every dollar. Um, within, within a year, they moved me to Asia. I have uh, lived in Japan for uh, six years, Beijing for a year, Korea for a year, and now Hong Kong over five years. Uh, and we've done big and small deals. And, and a few good deals, but some really bad deals. Uh, we own MTV in Japan. We started Starbucks in China. Um, uh, good Morning Securities in Korea. We were the first institutional investors in SMIC, the first semiconductor foundry in China. Um, all sorts of things, but lots of random tough deals as well. Um, mm -hmm. We moved to Hong Kong because uh, we had a, uh, we, my wife was, our, our family was blessed with twins. Uh, and our daughter uh, lost her water, you know, in womb uh, at week 18. And medical care in Japan is atrocious if you are in need for acute care or special need, you know, early intervention sort of thing. Uh, so we lost her, but our son, who was born 600 grams, uh, like his head was this big, like a little Martian, uh, we knew he, we had to get him out of Japan for him to actually have a chance. And so uh, before he was too old, we look for a place you know, where you could actually pay for services. Imagine that, right? Um, this was during the height of the financial crisis, so, so we were in no mood to move back to the United States. And uh, just kind of everything lined up for us to be here in Hong Kong. Hmm. So uh, we landed in Hong Kong. My first thing was, again, just because of what my experience was, I was, a I was the chief turnaround guy for a publicly listed company in Hong Kong from our former employers uh, you know, at this private equity fund uh, that they got, in, they, they got into a deal and they weren't able to control it. They needed to get out. So I worked on that for two years, getting a lay of the land. We exited that investment. And then uh, I realized just how special Hong Kong could be uh, about three and a half years ago. Met some, you know, the real pioneers of this new generation of startups, you know, uh, KC Lau, uh, but John Buford really at his uh, uh, Boot HK original campus in Wan Chai. And I started to see kind of all the things that I would take, granted for, take for granted in Los Angeles, you just could not in, in Hong Kong. And it was really keeping entrepreneurs and great ideas from being able to flower here. And so you know, we started Hong Kong Commons to address that need to, you know, we don't want any freeloaders, but we wanted to create an environment that was as flexible and as uh, hassle-free as possible at the very lowest possible cost so that if we were full, we would be marginally losing a, a few dollars uh, so that people could just focus on their startups. And then we realized that people were spending way too much money to make their companies. So we Walmarted that, right? So we, 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 did a, we started a break-even business where we will give you your company, including the government fees, including the green box for 300, effectively 300 euro, like 3,200. Mm -hmm. And I think that's how we met, right? You need yep. to set up your company. Uh, and then, you know, we like to invest. We have our little family holding company and a few bucks. And um, we, back then, it was hard to find companies to, to invest in, so we just started making some up. 
You know, we thought we saw some really interesting threads and some interesting people, so we just started spraying and praying. And uh, fortunately, most of them are still around. Uh, they're all revenue positive. They're all break even now. We're profitable, and so we're now focused on uh, really building on this foundation out. You know. Um, I'm doubly committed and, and uh, confident that Hong Kong is probably the smartest place to be if you're an entrepreneur right now. You know, I think I'm, you know, when I see all these folks from Europe and from the Americas and guys like you and me here, uh, I just spent two weeks in Europe. I was at DLD in Munich, at Venice, at uh, speaking at H Plus Farm, the hottest incubator in Italy, uh, Davos. You know, we met a bunch of people there. We, I spoke at Potsdam University in Berlin, HEC in Paris. I finally visited our Lithuanian office. Um, then I just came back after speaking at the Russian Economic Forum in Krasnoyarsk. Um, all roads need to come here. So uh, we, uh, for all the right reasons, so we just uh, established a great friendship and a relationship with H Plus Farm, the place where, we, where I spoke in Venice in July or January. Uh, and we've already committed, uh, we've already penciled a million, dollar, million Hong Kong dollar uh, investment into one of their startups. Uh, very, very smart company. Um, we hope to announce uh, new locations in KL and in Taipei and other high-value locations soon. Mm -hmm. Now, is this all you, or is this through partners and other companies that you've worked with Great before? Great question. Uh, we've tried everything. Um, and I think depending on the company, some things and sometimes you just have to do it your way or by yourself. Sometimes you need to work with partners. Uh, and I can't say what generally works or doesn't work. For me, one of the things um, I've tried to do is the ideas tend to be my ideas, and I don't want people to buy into an idea. It's, this is not Silicon Valley, mm -hmm. um, and I'm not going to go work all the time for my idea. So we'll have a team. So, we, so I almost have an internal in consulting team that we can say, go work on this, do the research, figure out the math. Then we have our own subsidiary in Lithuania that has a lot of software developers with lots of different skills. So we can kind of throw things together and play with things uh, to get a proof of concept, and then we'll put the first dollar in, and, and until something actually kind of germinates and you can actually start seeing the first fruits, we don't want to talk to anybody about money. It's always good to have outside investors after you're able to take that initial risk to be able to validate what someone else thinks your company is worth or your, your work is worth. Um, our social enterprise, Bonham Strand, is a great example. We spent a year, I mean, I'm not a tailor, you know, I don't know any, I go to Costco to buy my shirts, right? So. Mm -hmm. um, but when I landed here in Hong Kong five years ago, I'm from LA, so I mean, the only thing we do well is get high in LA, right? So <laughs> it's, we're the capital and the kings of the drug culture. But unfortunately, that means all of us in LA have family or friends with a substance abuse problem. We know intimately well what it is like to deal with successful drug rehabilitation. It is not easy, and it's a lifelong thing. Um, Front of the brain knew better when you were in Hong Kong, sure. If you see no hope, why not get wasted today? Mm -hmm. I saw that in Japan, you know, in different ways. But, you know, I saw this big front page, uh, this not front page, yeah, it was a front page article saying drug abuse is skyrocketing among young, young Hong Kong kids. And, you know, it's, being a lawyer, they teach you about really looking at the assumptions and, the, and scrutinizing numbers. And when, they, when, the, when the Hong Kong government gives you a number for drug addiction. It's defined as those individuals who voluntarily report to the police that they have a drug problem. So, hmm. So that number is 16,000. I actually think the number is more like 150,000. Uh -huh. um, and it used to be very soft drugs like, spe like ketamine, special case stuff, and you know, um, lots of cold, cold things that you and I need right now, codeine and things like that. But you know, the meth production has moved from, you know, from just like all the other forms of manufacturing from the North America to Asia. Mm -hmm. There's so much meth and ice being cooked in Shenzhen right now, it's kind of not funny. So what we know and what we ex we've experienced in the U.S., we know is coming. If you go to Bangkok and ride in a taxi, they say now about half of those guys are fried. They're lit. So not five, half of those guys are cooking, you know, or, or, or are baked. A few days later, I saw another article that talked about how tailoring you know, is a dying industry. And they described why it was not a cool thing to do anymore. So the job description sucks if you're a normal kid with a life and an iPhone and a girlfriend. 
you know, it's detail oriented, it's structured, it's repetitive, and the hours are long. And then a light went off in my head, so that's the inspiration part, where if you look at that description, that's exactly something that you would want in successful drug rehab. From the minute these kids get up to the minute, you know, to the, to where the second after the lights go off, they don't have a spare, a solitary minute, right? They're in group and they're in activity. We know this to be true. So the idea is like, well, what if we turn that liability into an asset? What if we said the harder your addiction, the more OCD you were, so that what if that makes you a better tailoring candidate? Especially if we can find you while you're in lockdown at a lockdown facility like at Caritas or St. Barnabas, some of our partners. But then with that idea, we spent a year beating up the idea because we knew nothing about tailoring. So we went to Mirador mansions and tried to learn more and meet tailors. We went to rehab centers and you know, building a model. How do you reinvent this throwaway business and these throwaway people, you know, just to see if you can? And then how do we stick it and you know, stick somebody's eye, you know, and say, look, I mean, we don't think the current model of social enterprise works. We don't think charities work because they don't really do anything um, except make you feel better for 30 seconds given a dollar or whatever. Um, so after a year, we announced, you know, Bonham Strand, it's a for-profit social enterprise, but with the commitment that the shareholders will never take any money from it, and I don't pay myself. But part of the reason why we did that is to be able to show that a social enterprise should be able to make real money, and if you can't afford to pay 17% in tax on the income, on the profit of your work, which is all Hong Kong asks for, there's no VAT. Right? And there's no progressive this and there's no all this crazy stuff. You really are a charity. And you have no business calling yourself a for profit if you can't do that. I mean, that's the lowest tax burden I've ever seen in this world. Um, and then to be able to figure out how do we make it scale because we're venture guys. We're not interested in spending a year of expensive time to be able to provide a living wage for 20 people. I don't remember, I don't remember what your question was, sorry. <laughs> this is all interesting though yeah. so but it's crazy so that kind of stuff i'm not going to ask someone to invest uh -huh. so we tell about tell people about the idea and they go wow that's pretty cool uh we're putting an impact round together now but again just another these bugaboos right and we know what the stories are we don't like broken stories impact investing is not investing it's still charity people don't expect the money back and so we're like let's not talk about valuations or equity let's talk about fixed income let's talk about debt I understand debt. Chinese people understand debt. Let's put a high yield on it, like 8%, you know, something not crazy, but not nothing, you know, and let's put it on the balance sheet of the company so that people know we owe money, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, we use these as little vehicles, small dollars. We just opened a location in Hollywood Road because we wanted to, you guys, if you've been on the escalator, there's a little octopus standing right next to it, this window. So we turned that into a workshop so that, you know, Von Hamstrand's the first company to actually make something other than a drink on Hollywood Road in decades. Uh -huh. um, but, you know, it was 200,000 bucks to put a deposit and a little set up. But we used those little things as a way to invite other people that we like, come invest. But don't give, don't want, you know, I don't want your money in equity because I'll never be able to give it back to you. So it was an easy deal. Six easy installments, 10% interest, here you go and he'll get his money back with profit as a social investment. It's very rare and unfortunately rare to be able to say, I actually put money in the social enterprise, I got my money back, and I made money. Mm -hmm. So tell us about some of your other businesses that you're working on. So, well, tell us about Hanson Robotics. This is sure. the newest one. This is pretty right. exciting. Tell us more about that. Uh, yes, we're, we're super excited about it. So Dr. Hanson's been working on uh, the hardest part of robotics. So if you look at what Silicon Valley does. They're trying to force you to become more like machines, right? I wear a DLD and they have one of those goofy things on wheels with the LCD one and are bothering you, right? Like there's a mountain of clinical data that, sh that, that confirms, you know, the more human the robot looks, or the more human something looks, the easier it is for humans to relate. It's just kind of common sense and the clinical data confirms it. So Dr. Hansen's been focusing on making robots more like us between not only the, the software the expression engines and the ability to real time just make you feel like you're dealing with a real human being and being able to respond to you with random you know not linear cut and paste you know comments you know like Siri right mm -hmm. um, but also the hard part in you know, fusing art software 
and physical mechanical robotics into head forms. We, fo we focus on heads only that are as close to real human beings as you've ever seen. Things that you've only seen like an avatar on film because it's not real. Uh, we have patented technology uh, uh, that do things like frubber, which is a nano, uh, nano, nano, nano material that we use for the skin that overcome some of the traditional hurdles of making lifelike robots. So as you can imagine, human skin is actually quite porous. And it's quite elastic. So when you smile or you frown or you, you, know, you cry, the amount of energy your muscles need to be able to manipulate the muscles okay, and the skin attached to the muscles is actually quite small. If you look at, if you've been to, you have, you have kids, right? So if yeah. you've been to the Hall of Presidents at Disneyland, Disney World in Orlando, what we're used to seeing are goldfish people, like zombie golems, right? So, uh -huh. you know, the eyes blink and the mouth moves, but it's obviously a joke. Uh -huh. And Disney spends a million dollars for that pathetic joke. And it's been like that for decades because in the Hall of Presidents, you can see the first one and the latest one, and they all suck. <laughs> They're not close to being expressive enough for us to say, wow, that's pretty cool. Part of that is because the skin, they use silicone and latex, which are very hard to stretch. It requires a tremendous amount of energy to manipulate. So Frubber uses 95% less energy. With less energy, we're able to pack tons of brushless servo motors into a head and to be able to replicate every human muscle group and therefore every human gesture in small, tiny, minute increments so that it really feels natural. Yeah, I've seen the videos. They're kind of freaky. It's a little scary, right? Yeah. So what's the real commercial opportunity there other than selling them to Disney? Well, we'll sell them to everybody but Disney. Uh -huh. uh, but uh, uh, it'll depend on the... We're, we're looking at different stages. Right now, um, one of the reasons why we established our office in Hong Kong is in terms of theme parks, entertainment, retail, you know, and, you know, the next Madame Tussauds. All of that new construction, those new locations are going to be in Asia. There are no new theme parks in France. There are no new theme parks in California. It's not, doesn't make any financial sense, right? Those are going bankrupt and being bought on the cheap and rehabbed by private equity guys. Mm -hmm. I think depending on, some, depending on who you ask, there may be 200 new theme parks in Asia over the next 10, 20 years. You know, guys like Wanda, they're paying big money, just like Hollywood's moving here, right? It's all entertainment for an emerging middle class. Um, so retail, imagine at the convention center, a, a, a human looking customer service person that's got great top notch language identification software, great language libraries and general AI, but with a twist, right? Imagine call centers and load balancing so that if someone approaches and starts speaking to this human looking customer service robot in English, I, I know that you're speaking English, I'm going to talk to you, and if I can answer your questions based on my automated AI, you're happy, I'm happy. But I've already alerted my English-speaking language call center, I don't know, in the Philippines, that there is a customer here. We'll pay twice as much as the regular call center guy to make sure that we have very, very seamless transition. Our software then, in case the operator has to get involved with you in the real human sense, We'll have a webcam that reads me as the, as the service operator in Manila. And every expression, every smile, every mannerism that I have gets translated into a three-dimensional physical avatar. So you are having a real human-to-human -human experience, right? And the minute you go, thank you, and move off, and the Japanese guy comes and starts speaking Nihongo, right? If I can identify that as Japanese, alert a Japanese call center, right? All of a sudden, you have a Babylon, a Tower of Babylon in one, right? I imagine nurses, you know, I mean, low cost. So that's the near hanging fruit. That doesn't require a terrible amount of artificial intelligence. Over the next few years, uh, if you look at the future of robotics, it's in service robotics. It's not industrial robotics. That's over and done. The Japanese, the Westerners, Europe, the, everybody knows the benefits of it, but it's done. 80%, if you believe the Koreans anyway, 80% um, of robotics in the future will be service robotics. The dollar value will be in services because that's where the people are and people are not efficient. Um, if you can imagine the two big bugaboo in the e in economies or industries that dominate global 
GDP. The world's GDP is about $72 trillion. Of the $72 trillion, 14 and a half, healthcare. 14, education. If you've ever been to a hospital, or if you remember school, I think most people would say 90% of that is wasted or ineffective. It's kind of scary. I thought half my teachers were robots when I was in school. There you go. Well, that means they were actually semi-effective. No. Um, so if you look at the money and the numbers, I'm from LA. You go to Kaiser Permanente, all those nurses are Filipina. And God bless them. They're wonderful. Mm -hmm. That same Filipina, there are 300,000 Filipinas in the Philippines who've already passed the US boards waiting for their lottery ticket. Guaranteed lottery ticket. They make 300 to 400 US dollars per month in Manila as a registered nurse having passed the US boards. As soon as that wonderful lady arrives in Los Angeles, she's, it costs the US taxpayer six to 8,000 US dollars for that same wonderful person. It's a 20X, that's a total lottery. Unfortunately, we're broke. We're just broke, can't afford it. And costs will continue to rise. Imagine using human robotics, but you don't, violate any no-nos. You never touch the patient. But there's cloud technology, there's facial recognition. Using facial recognition, our AI and our human faces on low, low load or no load bodies. So they're very inexpensive to make. You never touch the patient. I can first identify, that's Josh. He's in his right bed. I know what's wrong with you. I know what your vital should be. And I know the thresholds, right? Green, yellow, red. I know that if I can detect something going wrong with you earlier, the cost of, right, the cost of healing you or rectifying that situation is much lower. I know that that robot can provide much better service and make far fewer mistakes and not pass you any diseases because it's not an organic entity and work 24 hours a day, right, to do AI assessment I think you're feeling a little warm. I'll go, Josh, how are you doing? You seem a little warm. Are you doing okay? And what is medicine? It's regurgitating what you memorized. I know your diagnosis. I, if you have elevated temperature, I need to ask you these 12 questions. Based on what you ask, I have a preliminary diagnosis. That same wonderful Filipina is still in Manila. Let's pay, let's pay her double, 600 bucks, right? She's happy. Mm -hmm. She's operating 10 of them, right? Load balance, it's like Ethernet. She knows now that Josh has a problem, and now she's paying attention but not jumping in yet. As soon as the robot's finished diagnosing with a preliminary diagnosis, a human being nurse, telemedicine, right, who's actually observed the patient interaction, has your complete file history, and has passed the US boards. So she's actually certified. We'll do a second opinion, and then call Nurse Jackie, who's physically there, Say, Nurse Jackie, here's the deal. Here's what she said. Like, if you want the video, here you go. Nurse Jackie will then be the first one to touch if necessary. Josh will say, yeah, you know, I think there's something going on. Let me call Dr. Jane, right? If you think about what a nurse does, because it's that kind of business, 90% of what she does on a given day, other than emergency medicine, right? Not nursing. It's administrative, it's technical, it's all this other stuff. And then you have to multiply that by three shifts, right? We want to be able to reduce, to introduce human looking robots for 80,000 US dollars, right? With a couple thousand dollars a month service fee to run 24 hours a day. We, we are targeting a return on investment in five months to, to, to produce 10 times better service because you'll actually, that nurse will come by every 30 minutes to make sure and check in on you, right? 10 times better results, fewer infections, fewer mistakes, dosage is always right for nothing, because after five, five months, the hardware is fully depreciated, it's free. Service life, three or five years, that can change everything. Same thing for special needs, autism, uh, Alzheimer's. Things where you need, right now, human beings are paid a lot of money to do very repetitive things. All of a sudden, iRobot's looking more realistic, and this is a yeah, whole different take close. on right, Rise of the Machines, huh? Absolutely, and I think, uh, I don't know what the future, you know, what the future looks like. I think, um, you know, all the big guys are betting big, you know, big, big money, being very aggressive in this space. You know, the Googles, the Facebooks. Um, 
you know, I'm, I'm particularly excited about Hanson Robotics simply because it gets the human part right. This is the new interface, you know. Human beings that can act, robots that can look like human beings, act like human beings without any compromise. And for us to really kind of be open about it. We'll do the head and the eye. We'll, we're publishing an open source API, okay, and, and, and standard so that we can, you can pop our head on anybody. Whether it's a ball bot from Bossa Nova to a Boston Dynamics, you know, Terminator robot, whatever. You know, we're not, it, it's just a PC, right? I mean, it's a tool. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, you know, if you've ever seen Dr. any of Dr. Hansen's lectures and these kind of graphs, <coughs> there's the, you know, the Moore's Law thing. If you, and I'm not saying that transistor, den transistor density is the same as, you know, human neural density. But, you know, I mean, depending on whose graph you're looking at, um, Transistor density, in terms of you know, in terms of equivalent to human brain neural networks, will exceed the human brain, you know, in, in the next few years, right? Between that and the massive pools of data that's getting connected real time, right? I would actually venture to say things have already changed. It's it's irreversible, you know. And if you slap that onto what you know, the Snowden guys are saying about your privacy and you know, which is actually the same thing that, that you know, our, our friend Mr. Schmidt said 10 years ago, that you have no more privacy. Mm -hmm. You know, I think the revolution's already happened, and we're just waiting for it to play out, and which way it goes, we'll have to see. So let's switch topics a little bit. Sure. Let's talk about Hong Kong and sure. the startup environment here. You get to see a lot of businesses come through your doors because you have right. a co-work space. You mm -hmm. see these businesses. You've invested in some businesses. What do you think are the opportunities for startups here in Hong Kong? You said this is where everybody needs to come. Why? Yes. So, it's a, so the topic of my talk at all of these locations in Europe <coughs> was Hong Kong is the hottest startup city in Europe. Okay, so let's just start with some fundamentals. Okay, Every, there's only three money center cities in the world. London, New York, and Hong Kong. Hong Kong is the only money center city with money. Number one. Number two, if you look at every major economy or every city as a casino, which is what they are, you know, and they're trying to draw more action to, your t to their table, you always ask the same questions. How much does the house keep, whether I win or lose? You know, that kind of stuff, right? And how good are the drinks? Um, as an entrepreneur, you know, I'm, I'm pretty libertarian about this stuff. I think it's essential for a house, a casino, Okay, or a venue, or a marketplace. They're all the same, right? They're different words, but the same thing. Question is, can they deliver three essential ingredients for successful entrepreneurism? Number one, do I have freedom to move people? Do I have freedom to move ideas? And do I have freedom to move money? Right? And if you see what's happening in the world today, right? You know, in the U.S., you, you and I know, if I wire you $11,000, I'm on the list. Yeah. Right? <laughs> in Europe, if you want an internet connection at a hotel, you have to go get a physical ticket. They want to know everything. So there's this wrapper. Not only do these three rules have to be true, how does the capo, okay, does Tony Montana play a fair game where he's not competing with you, right? So Hong Kong says this, right? It's a different three. Respect the fact that I'm a real government. Therefore, number one, I'm the only one that can print money or get other people to print money for me. Number two, I can determine whether I want a monopoly on physical violence, legal physical violence. And number three, all I'm asking from you is to send a little thank you Christmas card or whatever card, holiday, happy holiday card once a year, thanking me that for not imposing VAT, GST, sales taxes, capital gains taxes, withholding taxes, on offshore income taxes, right? And then if you just follow my simple rules, I honestly don't care. I don't have a dog in this hunt. Right? Hong Kong people are famous for saying, make money, la. Right? Just don't cause trouble. Go make some money. And go buy a Mercedes or buy some real estate. That's how they get their big. Right? They just don't care. It's not just about low taxes. It's about true freedom 
And that starts with a, a Caesar that just says, this is a free market, I don't, I'm not gonna compete with you. Korea cannot say that, China cannot say that, certainly America, nowhere in Europe, nowhere in Russia or Singapore. Everybody wants to know everything. Everybody wants to know your business, right? If you're using telco here, you know how cheap it is to get broadband and mobile here. Think about whether the, a Hong Kong telco is gonna care enough about sniffing your packets, about knowing everything you do, right? They can't afford it. Competition is so brutal, they're not buying layer seven application content filter you know, routers from the hottest startup shops to give that information to the NSA. They don't care and they can't, and the market's so efficient that chances are they don't have the gear even if they wanted to care. So, you know, that's why I travel so much. Now I'm going to Taipei and KL and Singapore because I think all roads for entrepreneurs should be here, but I truly believe in some of the fundamentals of Economics 101. One thing is comparative advantage. We love H Farm. They have a beautiful campus, nothing that we'd even want to compete with, and brilliant, creative people. That's not something I get so much in Lithuania. I get great architects and plumbers and code guys in Lithuania. If you look at the pockets of relative comparative advantage and say, well, let's bring it all here to Hong Kong because we have the freedom to move people, money, and ideas. And again, the ability to the freedom to move ideas means being in a marketplace where people don't judge your idea. They just do whatever you want. You know, there is literally, in my humble opinion, there is literally not another marketplace that can give you that today. So there are also some challenges, though. I mean, Absolutely. real estate's crazy. Yes. What are some of the other challenges entrepreneurs have to overcome here? So I actually wrote a little article for InvestHK's Toronto office on this real estate thing. If your, job, your goal was to create one of these multi-level marketing scams like you know, New York Life's annuity insurance stuff, right? This is bullshit, right? Then you should worry about real estate. What do I mean by that? You want to have a bunch of overpriced scam artists, right, in one office, dial a dollar, 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 right? So there, you want, you're envisioning on having a long-term plan, five, 10, 20 years, lots of people, okay? Healthy, but not venture-type returns where you have to worry a lot about the cost per square foot over the next 10 years, over the next 20 years. If you're an entrepreneur, you're gonna flame up or out in months, right? If you're successful with one round of funding, great. You're growing. You need to move out of your space. If you're successful as a startup, Hong Kong real estate is the last thing you should worry about. Success will, bre will breed more success, including more money, right? But you need to grow. It's very organic, right? You either grow or you die, right? You don't want to be stuck in a place like Japan just because you know the rent never increases because your company needs to be growing. Your needs in terms of human resources should be changing every six months to a year, which makes Hong Kong unbelievably ideal because the leases are short, right? They're happy to give you like, uh, you know, your apartments. You can, they, can, they can kick you out in 14 months, right? Two year leases are kind of typical for our office space here, right? Um, so if you think about the actual, what you want as a startup, real estate is actually not a problem. If you're a small businessman or a, a freelancer, or you want to have a small consulting shop for a long time where you want to stay, yes. But we're interested in startups that create radical growth that will grow, 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 and be sold, or go public, or create, determine its own destiny. Uh, there are plenty of problems though. Okay, so number one, Hong Kong is the only money center city in the world with money. Unfortunately, it's mostly dumb money, but for rational reasons. Okay, for the longest time, you know, family offices and all the investors in Hong Kong, they have not had a good experience with venture and startup deals. There have not been a lot of good startups. Not, not, there have always there've been some, but not a ton. And you know, the smart money is in Valley and New York and London, so if a deal comes out here, the presumption is it's not a good deal. And a lot of times, they're not good deals. Um, so rationally, over the past 10 years, they've made a higher IRR on dumb investments, real estate, you know, public securities, things that they understand. So they've made a rational decision not to invest in startups because they have, it has not paid. 
Now with the public markets and real estate sucking wind, you're seeing much, much more open-mindedness, even with traditional family offices, because they're not making the same easy returns on easy deals. They get it. They're simply being rational. Number two, uh, even though the domestic market and the local Hong Kong money may not be that switched on, Hong Kong is the cheapest place to be able to run a business. Okay, I love hiring Americans and smart Europeans. As an employer, it costs me half for the same purchasing power for that American kid to be in Hong Kong than in Los Angeles. Okay, and I wanted that the, one of the little graphs, I, one of the spreadsheets I showed at the, at the, at the talks in, in Europe, you know, was what it looked like to be a winner. You know, you graduate from Harvard, your starting salary is 60,000 bucks, ooh, you know, 70,000 bucks. You end up broke with the taxes and your cost of living and all the stuff in LA, you lose 15 to 20,000 bucks a month, a year, as a winner, okay? Mm -hmm. And that $60,000 cost the employer 100, right? So 100 to me from me, 60 gross, his take home's about 40, 35 to 40, and after his fixed expenses, he's got nothing. Forget the student loan. The net purchasing power relative to my cost, as an investor, you want every dollar to count, right? It's by far you get better value for every dollar invested in Hong Kong than any other place I've been to. And that's helped by the fact that you can you have this freedom to move people in and out here, much more so than in America and Europe. Um, second thing, Hong Kong is a global money center. There is people, there are people, and there are accounts controlled by people from all over the world, but the money's here. I see most of the investments in Hong Kong from international or expats or foreign investors. Big guys are starting to get it. More and more venture capital firms are very open to investing in companies outside of Silicon Valley, even if they won't, don't have an office there. They get it. They understand this isn't China, this is not Mongolia, Russia, or an offshore company. This is a real jurisdiction, English language, real law, and that there are real standards, and they are increasingly getting more comfortable about that. What are the problems? Um, there is not a critical mass of tech entrepreneurship here yet. Uh, yes, that's true, but I, and, well, there's, there are two related issues. There's not a critical mass of entrepreneurship and tech startups here yet and, and, and kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, alternative capital, right, risk and angel capital. In addition, have at the same time something that Americans have not seen in 25 years, man. You know, and that's why I've been bouncing back between Europe and here. All of the disintermediation between the supply chain and the distributors, okay, between the time something shows up in a port and a consumer buys it, everything's been squashed in the U.S., right? I mean, there are just no more wholesale. I mean, it's just been squashed, right? Everything's been, you know, scaled down so that you're getting max of huge value for a dollar in the U.S. That's just beginning in Asia. And that's just beginning in Europe. If you go to Germany, the kind of just old school distribution networks where they just keep flipping the stuff. Everybody makes a little bit of a margin and the consumers pay for it. This sort of rationalization and disintermediation to get more value for the consumer's dollar is really in the third inning in Asia, almost everywhere in Asia and in Europe. So if you think, I teach a class at Hong Kong Poly University, or something else I didn't mention. So I teach a class in the master's degree program called Reinventing Traditional Businesses Using the Internet and New Media. You, you know, there are probably 20,000 traditional businesses waiting to be reinvented, okay? Just probably in Hong Kong. And I don't think any of them are gonna be a billion dollar exit, but I can see a thousand of them being 50 to 200 million dollar exits. And you know, guys, I mean, that's not a bad return for a few years worth of work. You know, things like our button business. It's, there is no satisfactory counterpart if you're some DIY mom in Nebraska. You're not even in a garment district if you're brave enough, you know, and not worried about getting shot in downtown LA, right, to go dumpster diving in a wholesale button district. Right? But you simply don't have a choice. And you can't do that business unless you're in Hong Kong. And there's a million of those kinds of businesses that if you focus, what does that give you? Yes, there's not a ton of funding, but you can be revenue positive very quickly, and you can fully expect to be profitable so you can have the time to decide what you want to do, right, in six months. 
Within a year, if you have revenue and profitability, now you're eligible for non-dilutive debt. You're a profitable small business and you're, the Hong Kong HSBC is happy to lend you money. Right? You have audited financials, you have an account, you have real books, you're bringing money in from outside, everyone loves you. you know? So there's a lot of these opportunities where one, two, three smart people kind of see, and if they've been in the US somewhere else, they can see, wow, that's unbelievable. You know, we can fix that, we can get rid of some of these things and reinvent the business. Most of these businesses are being thrown away, like our tailoring business. Everyone's happy to squeeze that thing until it's dead and then move on. There are tons of these businesses in Europe and in Asia. Um, what else? You know, uh, critical mass. If you think about Silicon Valley in New York and London, I mean, how many startup guys in Silicon Valley do you think are actually formed from Palo Alto? Almost none, right? These people, those cities have done a great job making a market where people who have talent from all around the world show up to play ball. My bet, what I believe is Hong Kong's rules are free enough, right? And things are not so great in LA or New York. And things aren't actually that great across the board in San Francisco, right? I mean, look, it costs you $50,000 gross to hire a frickin' secretary you know, in Palo Alto who didn't even go to college, okay? And all he wants to know is what are my benefits and it cost me 80,000 bucks. And what's a, what, you know, you can keep the brain trust in Palo Alto, but you don't need that, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so if the free market works, if there are rational players, and as the market becomes more and more interconnected and global, the more receptive and the friendlier the market, I think the faster the critical mass acceleration. And I think, look, I mean, you know, looking, other than Boon HK, I don't know of any other co-work guys that were there three and a half years ago other than us. And we just did it because we just thought it was, it, they just, you know, that, that it's a shame there weren't more venues for people just to kind of focus on their startup. Now there's what, 20, 30? And, and the models, because it's a free market, have run the gamut from, you know, incremental income guys, you know, just another real estate play because like in San Francisco, most of the co-work spaces are just no different than the, the timeshare scams that they used to get in Vegas, right? It's fractionalization and you have a higher yield. It works, good for them. It's a good, honest, legal business model. So you have from free to timeshare or fractionalization. You see 30 of them in Hong Kong and they run the same full gamut, which is great. Uh, we talk with, uh, Hanson, we just had a, a very good conversation with a very large venture capital firm at Hanson Robotics. They're not based in Hong Kong, and you know we're already scheduling a follow-up meeting. Um, the talent follows opportunity. I think opportunity will continue to come here, which means the talent comes here, which means the money comes here. If you look at where we are th from th versus three years ago, we're talking, I mean, multiples, multiples more. Um, what else is there? I don't know. Let's it's, take some questions from sure. uh, people because people have questions to ask about stuff. What questions do you have for John? He's got great experience with the startup community about starting businesses, about what investors are looking for. So shout out a question. Sure. And then What's I'll your name? It. So talk a lot about the comparisons with Silicon Valley, San Francisco. I'm from San Francisco. Where from? Where in San Francisco? Were you born in San Francisco? No, I'm not born, in, born in Michigan. Ah, you see? But, but it's been the majority okay, of the Okay, fair enough. Yeah. Um, and I actually have a business there. And a lot of talk right now from that investor community in California is what do investors look more for? Are you more sitting in, in these companies that are like solopreneurs, like one person, or two or three co-founders? And there's sure. kind of an argument over what is more appealing as an investor. Do you want more cooks in the kitchen, more co-founders, or, or is it an equal opportunity for, for just individuals as well? So let me repeat the sure, question. Sure. So the question is, are investors here in Hong Kong looking more for solopreneurs, individual entrepreneurs, or teams of entrepreneurs? Teams, yeah. That's a great question. I think I have a few different answers, unfortunately, because um, I want more questions. Number one, I've had to learn the hard way, whether it's one person or a team, you want to find people you think are very smart, very hungry, 
okay, and very committed that you can trust. They have some backbone that it's not going to run away when things get tough. These things always get tough. Um, unfortunately, that's not easy to find anywhere, including Hong Kong. And that is one of the challenges. Um, and you know, uh, it's a worldwide phenomenon, right? As fewer and fewer kids have siblings, they become very self-absorbed. So it's all about me, 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 me. I can't tell you how many of these stupid essays we get. You know, people who want to speak or involved in TEDx because you know you don't understand my story. I don't care about your story because it's not different than any of the other guys, right? It's about you know what's your value to the rest of the community, right? Get over your narcissistic self, right? That's a huge challenge. Okay, so having said that, I personally don't like investing in solo entrepreneurs because I've had to learn a lot of lessons from working for an Asian private equity firm, right? That when you do that and something goes wrong, the investor has to go roll up his sleeves and go work for free. I lost a lot of money last year trusting people I shouldn't have trusted because I was, thought I was being a good guy. You know, I lost a couple million US dollars last year and I had to go work in stupid things and I, I wasted a ton of my money, ton of my, more valuable, a ton of my time. Um, so if I have a choice, I would much rather back a team. The Italian startup that I like a lot Four very smart PhDs. Not the most commercial people, but I can help there. But they're thoughtful and they complement each other quite well. They stood head and shoulders above some of the other guys I saw and other great startups. Uh, as far as local investors, A, you know, they're all over the place because, you know, I mean, just like even in the Valley, right? You go to a startup angel event and 95% of the guys who say they're angels aren't real angels. They're bullshit, right? They want free equity for giving you two introductions or whatever, or they're headhunters or recruiters or service providers. Same here, maybe 98%. Um, I think what investors are looking for everywhere around the world, if they're real investors, is show me. Right? It's so cheap to get a proof of concept. If you've got a job at Starbucks, you can afford to get a proof of concept up. Right? I don't read business plans just like nobody in the Valley reads. Who reads business plans? Unless you want you know, $10,000 from the science park or something, right? If you're trying to make me read a business plan, you don't value your time, you definitely don't value my time. Right? In the time it took for you to do that, you could have worked at McDonald's or Starbucks and paid some Lithuanian to do that you know, proof of concept so that I could show, I can see. So. Uh, that number two, depending on who the investor is and what her his or her background is, you know, it may be fintech. It's big, you know. You hear that a lot here. Maybe someone who's a new investor just wants to follow what's hot, so cloud or security or whatever. Uh, ultimately, you know, it comes down to you know, do I think you're a smart guy? Do I think, you know, you actually are going to commit and actually take this thing seriously? Do I have to babysit you? Okay. Are you so stubborn? We, Hong Kong Commons, we, we specialize a lot on what Hong Kong does well. Second career people. If you're 19 years old and a brilliant blah, 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 that's, Hong Kong's probably not where they're going to throw tons of money at you. Tons of guys who work for other companies or other things for a few years and are, and are, are more mature and kind of know what they want to get done. Right? We love those guys. Okay? So, uh, going back to the question, you know, if we can find smart guys that we respect are smart, that kind of know what they want to get done and actually can show deliverables, okay, that makes us interested. We're not a Silicon Valley shop, as you can see from the kind of rant. We have a website called goodchow.hk. We deliver USDA choice steaks to your house, okay, for 23 Hong Kong dollars. We obviously don't make any money on that business, but it's a different business, right? It's a different business. It, but that was driven by, I'm Korean, I like beef, and I hate the nasty crap that my wife was buying for way too much money. But it addressed an issue, you know? The real estate in this backward, non-e-commerce market here, in such a high-density city, just made no sense. It's just stupid, right? So show me something that works. And in Hong Kong, it's cheaper and faster to show something that works. And you've got a whole menagerie of dumb, stupid businesses that could yield great cash flow with just a little bit of effort. And if you say, this is what I did, you know, and I'm looking for growth capital, which is so much easier to ask for in Hong Kong, right? You're from, you, you know what, I'm, I'm telling the truth, okay? To get a non-crap junkie 
to be at a receptionist is 50,000 bucks. And he sucks. You know, it's really terrible value. I lived on Fifth and Mission. There's no value there. And what's happening? Things, makers matter. Silicon Valley hasn't made anything physical in a very long time. Healthcare matters, okay? Mechanical engineering with, you know, control, you know, electronic control experience, stuff where you have to get your hand. That ended in the valley when aerospace left 40 years ago. Silicon Valley is no longer a natural home for real stuff. And the same applies for London and the, all the startup hubs actually don't make anything. Think about what that means. Right? None, of, none of yesterday's capitals of venture capital are in regions where they earn an honest living. <laughs> it's much harder, which is why we do robotics, right? To get exponential leverage when you have to physically break or make something. Everybody wants a cut and paste and charge your license for whatever. Yeah, it's a, that's really coming to so f quickly to an end where unless you're huge, you're done. Hope I answered your question. <laughs> question. Yes. Um, it's Kevin. I, I was Hi, Kevin. born in San Francisco. Yay! I just you, my accent. Yeah, I was going to say, <laughs> when did you leave? <laughs> there you go. Okay. <laughs> I grew up in the UK and just moved over from New York. Fantastic. Where, where in the UK are you from? Uh, well, I lived in London for about five years, but I grew up in Bath in the West of England. Wow, okay. Um, but my question was just on Shenzhen, because it's kind of related yes. to what you were just saying. I was, I was just interested in your take on how that kind of can be leveraged here and kind of whether mm -hmm. there's like a symbiotic relationship. Great question. So how can Shenzhen be leveraged here based on proximity to Hong Kong? It depends on what you want to do. So if you're a maker and you've got all this stuff, um, I would say if you're a maker and, and you need uh, low-cost engineers who do injection molding, okay, very basic circuit design, all that stuff. There's a pretty good number of them at a fair price, and I, I price everything on actual productivity. Okay, uh, just no disrespect. I mean, I don't have a single Asian software developer in my entire company. Okay, in terms of value and reliability and Western, and they check their damn code in and they. They think about it, right? I mean, I didn't visit my Lithuanian office for two years because I didn't have to. Think about that. Any of you guys have had to manage a shop in Bangalore, okay? Or a development shop in Shenzhen, or you can't do that. You have to run it like a factory. You gotta send one of your people there. Otherwise, God knows what's gonna happen. I did not, I didn't even know where it was for two years, right? So, depends on what you want. Now, if you want China market, don't be in Hong Kong. China is a huge market. Yes, everybody understands that. But be in China. Just like if someone wants to be in the Bath market, you can't really call it in. Bath is not a different, it's a different country. In Wales, right? No, in the west of England. Oh, sorry, west of England, sorry. Yeah. Close, yeah, it's a different culture. You know, and if, like, if you want to do business with Italians, you've got to be in Italy. Everything is different. So if you're a pure China player, you have to be all in. You have to have a lot of money. It's a very mature uh, dot-com market. If you want to do small manufacturing, the relative cost to you as a startup to work with injection molding, there's a lot of toy prototype guys in Sham Shui Po and Mong Kok, plenty of those guys who are 40 or 50 that you can just hire. Yeah, they're gonna cost you 30, 40% more, yes, but you don't lose the whole day. Right? Time is the most precious thing you've got. As a startup, you need to be able to maximize your time advantage to market, right? Um, in terms of <clears throat> getting medium, small production guys to actually go and make something, your first run, five, 10,000 pieces of pe yes. The only place you're gonna really get that done uh, that's convenient, if you can trust the factory and they don't go out of business and take your deposit. That happens a lot in China because the medium factories are, it's very hard for them right now. Okay, financially it's very difficult. So I have friends in the sourcing business and this is happening, but not everywhere, all the time. Um, that's ideal for the Pearl River Delta. If you want to do large scale volume manufacturing, it doesn't happen in Shenzhen anymore. If you do, if you're a kitchen appliance guy or a smoke detector guy, all of that's actually moved out of Shenzhen. Okay, so, you know, cheap electronics and appliances. Ningbo was four years ago, I don't even know where it is now. But it's all out there. Uh, if you want to do high end stuff, 
and you worry if you're very sensitive about your IP or processes, um, Hong Kong is still great, but you wouldn't necessarily go to Shenzhen immediately. I, we would go to Thailand, Taiwan, Korea. They have a lot of partners that are very, but it's not the same price, but they kind of get it and they get it done. So guys like even Bang & Olufsen, you know, medium volume stuff, they, they make their stuff in, in ODM and OEM shops and outsourced manufacturing shops in, in Thailand. Um, what else? If you're in the food and beverage, you know, if they're in the consumer consumables business, I mean, PRD is huge. And look, I mean, you know, they're building all these roads and trains. I mean, Hong Kong will be increasingly interconnected, you know, and it's not a bad idea for you to be here and for your company to be here, but you really have to understand what those avenues mean. Now, the flip side of that, there are some really smart people in Shenzhen. Okay, something that you people should consider is hiring them here if you find the right one. And just like everywhere, you just, you never know. You gotta meet a lot of people. There are a lot of very smart, I teach this class I mentioned, um, 30 kids in my class, that's the maximum capacity in the class. Two thirds of them are mainland Chinese. You know, you spend a whole semester with these, some of these, and I've done it for two years now, all the best scores have gone to the PRC kids. Great, very talented. So Shenzhen is a large population with very smart but very ambitious people. You have to understand the deal, okay? And this is not America, this is not way back. Right? right, we've chosen to be here. We need to accept and understand this is the, you know, the, there are local rules no matter where you go, but there is a tremendous amount of value. I tend to think at this point there's probably more value in the people and the consumer market than the making stuff. But it's great to be so close, and it's gonna be even closer. But you know, the whole Hong Kong is the gateway to China, that's true, but I would submit Hong Kong is the gateway to Asia and the gateway to the world. If you have to pick one location for all the smart people and your money for your company to be, you gotta be here. Next question. I slightly learned the dimensions of the world in your talk, so from where I stand, Singapore is also a financial hub. Sure. It's also got all the street freedoms. I just said that. That's actually not true. Singapore is one of the most heavily censored markets in the world. That's good. It's good. Where are you from? Because you really cannot sell drugs. Oh, I'm not talking, I'm talking censorship, the movement of ideas. You have to be very careful what you say in Singapore. Singapore is traditionally known as one of the places where they sue journalists. Okay, and they go after you criminally so you can't come back if you say something that they don't like. Okay? The Hong Kong government's afraid of its shadow. I understand, so, but from, you know, from own strategy perspective, they don't have this shadow of China uh, looming over them. So many people here just think about what's going to happen to Hong Kong. That's a great point. Uh, so what's your so time window? You want well, to so, so let me re restate the question. Just, I mean, it's essentially Singapore versus Hong Kong sure. because a lot of people do bring up Singapore yeah, and say, hey, Singapore's yeah. giving out money. That's a great question. It's a great business yeah. environment. You talked all about why Hong Kong is so great. How but much a lot do you people, think this costs in Hong Kong? At 7-Eleven, the, the most expensive place for you to buy anything. <laughs> yeah. By the Less way, they're than, eight bucks here. If you're grabbing yes, them for deal. free out of the fridge, I, they're I actually, you down. actually owe, owe the hive eight bucks, so just so this you know. This costs less than one US dollar at the most expensive retail outlet in Hong Kong. It costs five times more in Singapore. It's good, you can't get drunk in Singapore. <laughs> <laughs> you can, just cost you more money, okay? Um, so there's a number of things about Hong Kong, Singapore. Um, Singapore will splash more small cash, but it disappears faster in Singapore for every unit of value that you get with those dollars than even San Francisco. You have terrible value to the software developers, okay? I mean, it's basically the Indian guys that can't make it, okay, in Japan or the US. Okay, it's total bullshit for software developers, you know. If you've been there, you know. Okay, value is terrible, and actually the effective taxation, if you, in terms of the employer contributions, the employee contributions, and all the other taxes they actually have, other than the income tax, it's, it's significantly higher than Hong Kong. Number three, Singapore does business like the Japanese. Everything is micromanaged. They have to know everything, they control everything. And if you're okay with that, great. But the, and things go move very slowly in Singapore. 
So as a startup, you know, if that's what you like, then I'm completely not interested, right? Number four is trying to question. It goes back to the, the real estate question, really. If you're a tech startup and the value is in your head and what's in the cloud, you know, the minute they change the official language in Hong Kong to Chinese, I'm gone. Right? You're checking out saying, see ya. Right? And just like the Russians did, they wired all their money outside of, out of American accounts a, a week ago, right? Because the laws allow you to do that here. And the US dollar and the Hong Kong dollar are locked. So as soon as they start playing funny with those kinds of things, you have the freedom to pick up sticks and get out of town. You have that ability because you are a startup entrepreneur. Okay? You're no different than free, free floating currency. The kinds of things that would make me, so you understand what I'm saying? If I was trying to build a school or a hospital, okay, or a commercial banking outfit where I, I need to be here for 30 years, I would worry more. Okay, but there is no other line of business where you can pick up sticks and go to another venue, right? Faster and more easily than what we do here today. Right? Think about the, the, by definition, this place, you don't, you're just renting by the month, you're gone. Or you're renting by the day. So in that context, what are you, what's the over under? Right? What are the penalty you're paying for being in Singapore for more distance from China? I can tell you, Australia, is terrible right now, right? Hong Kong isn't the only thing that depends on Chinese money, okay? Unemployment, it's actually much worse because there's very little value added by those people working in Australia, okay? So with commodity prices down, it sucks in Australia because it costs $5 for a bottle of water in Perth. It's a stupid joke. Singapore doesn't make anything, okay? So Singapore is heavily dependent on China trade. The Philippines and Indonesia are less, right? Malaysia are less. But I would submit to you all of Asia, okay, is dependent on China. And now that China's contracting effectively net of interest, net of inflation, everyone's feeling it. That's just a macro call, that's not a micro call. So and then, you know, finally, if you are, you know, if you're interested in Vietnam and Bangkok, there are geographic reasons why you're better off in Singapore. But I, you know, uh, I, we're interested in KL, we're interested in Jakarta, we're interested in Taipei, we're interested in Hanoi, uh, not Hanoi, Saigon, Ho Chi Minh City. Um, we may be in Singapore for different reasons because they've got a lot of strengths too, by the way, okay? They do have a lot of strengths, I'm not trying, but as an entrepreneur that really wants to kind of go get stuff done, right? Uh, I don't think they're in the same league. They're more like the old world than the new world. See, but, <clears throat> I just go ahead. First trend is China is getting more expensive to produce stuff. Uh, Hong Kong is getting more expensive to leave. Then Singapore is in the center of very good English speaking community. And then all the production is also flowing into Thailand and into the Philippines and all that stuff. So maybe the next trend. Where are you from? Uh, I'm from Russia. Okay, where in Russia? So from Far East. I so, I, so I was in Krasnoyarsk. Are you more east than that? Uh, yeah. Okay. Far Okay, so I would say there's two fundamental issues with your assumptions. I am super, super bullish on every former broke-ass democratic state in the United States that's gone right to work. So we did very well with Governor Daniels in Indiana. We love what Casey has done in Ohio, what Snyder has done in Michigan. And there's a new venture capital guy that's vowing to break the, the, the unions in Illinois. Illinois is a huge fount of, ability, of, of potential. If China gets more expensive, it doesn't help Singapore. Okay, all the high-end manufacturers move back to Mexico and the United States, man. Okay, and more and more manufacturing has moved to like Western Poland. If you look at, like, the, the Third Reich is kind of re-expanding. It's the Fourth Reich. They've assimilated Poland, the Czech Republic, Slovenia, Austria, Croatia. Right, it's back. Okay, all the quality manufacturing is leaving Asia, not just leaving China. Right? Because every year, compensation goes up 10, 20%. It catches up with you. Okay? So number one, when it comes to making things, 
that matter. Okay, the United States and Eastern Europe is where it'll happen. It's not gonna happen in Brazil. Brazil's a joke, right? We know this. BRIC is a joke, if that's, if that's what you care about. If you care about the domestic market in China, you gotta be in China, right? It's different. But if you wanna make a cheap widget and export it to white people, okay, it really depends now, okay? The second point is kind of linked. It's the same fundamental issue, right? You know, Singapore doesn't make anything. It's an island. It's by itself, and it's connected to Malaysia. Malaysians don't make anything, right? They don't make hard, they don't make anything. So where are you gonna make it? You still have to leave, right? Think about the political unrest in Thailand, right? Look what happened to our hard disk prices because of a flood and nobody had flood control, right? And that's a sad joke, right? The smart guys that do garment, right? The Korean Taiwanese guys that you know, couldn't compete with the mainland guys 10 years ago left China a, lot, a decade ago, okay? And they've been doing great stuff in everywhere, in Vietnam, okay, uh, in, in Indonesia, okay? Now in Bangladesh and all these things. Right? But it's no easier to do business in Bangladesh from Singapore than Hong Kong. Right? It's just not. And then finally, you've got to ask yourself, are you, gonna, are you a crypto guy where you just kind of, there's somebody who trades domains here, you just kind of do your own business, right? You stock and you figure out, you buy the list from, you know, is anybody stupid enough to look for it on like, uh, what is it? Uh, uh, what's the big uh, uh, network solutions, right? That's all. And they sell that list. So people will hunt you down and either... If you're just working for yourself, you can be anywhere. But if you actually have to have a team of 10, 20 guys, five guys, 10 guys, you know? Think about what it costs you to have 10 really good, smart guys in Singapore. Unless they're all 60 or 50 years old on their third marriage with lots of children. You do give up square footage. But everything else in Singapore is multiples more expensive per unit of productivity. And the more people you have, the worse it gets. Now, if you're a Russian code guy, you will get paid more in nominal dollars in Singapore. That is true. But I wouldn't hire a Russian in Singapore because I will open an office in Krasnoyarsk and Irkutsk. Right? Maybe that's where you're from. Why would I want to pay that arbitrage? Same reason why I don't want to hire a Filipino nurse in LA. If I want a Filipino nurse, I'll go to Manila. Right? Next question. So what do you think the hottest topic in Hong Kong? Uh, maybe technology or business, anything? So what's the, the hottest sector in Hong Kong? Hottest topic or hottest sector? Topic. Maybe topic. I want to build a company. What is the hottest area? Oh, so that's the hottest sector. Yeah. <laughs> It depends on how much, whether you're talking as a single entrepreneur or whether you know, you work, you're part of a family that needs a new business line because your old business is just generating cash but no future, or whether you just graduate with two or the three real smart classmates of yours. Assuming I already have uh, maybe two or three co-founders together. Okay. And are you from the mainland? Yes. Okay. If I were you, I would not... You know, maybe it's just because I'm an old man and I've made a lot of mistakes, but um, I would think of adopting Western best practices and technologies for critical acute service issues in China and use Hong Kong as a base. So my son was born four months early, okay, and we're really blessed because he's doing amazingly well, okay? He's really, really blessed. I mean, all the right therapists and schools and doctors open their hearts to him. If you think of a, a special needs child in a one-child policy country, right? Claire, let's say your parents had any money and you had a slight lisp or a, you were a mild spectrum. How much would your parents pay to get you on a normal school track? Right? Because if you don't get married, that's the end of the family. If you don't go to the right school, if you don't marry the right guy, right? Old school, right? If you have a speech impediment, you're not marketable, right? These things are soft skills. The quality of service is atrocious even for rich people in China, okay? There is a tremendous amount of service level, like these kind of niche but multi-billion dollar markets that are ripe for the taking and that goes to my broader scale. There are so many traditional businesses that are just done stupidly, like they were done 30 years ago before the internet. 
that three, four smart young kids with the cultural connection, because you're from China, and you start in whatever town you, you have a network, you know you can identify hundreds of problems that can generate revenue and a profit within 12 months, including paying yourself something, that, you, that can scale. But scale with cash flow so you don't have to depend on the next round of funding. If it's not there, then your growth trajectory is different, but you're still making money. I think that's what I would suggest. You know, there's so, that's a risk adjusted suggestion. There are so many of these opportunities in Asia for Europeans, Americans, and for, for, for locals, right? That you just gotta pick one and then make money, sell it. If you have cash flow, you can borrow against it and you expand it to yourself or you start another business, right? There are so many. It, it, it's not the case in the United States. It's a very efficient market. Okay? What about the other two kinds of uh, businesses you mentioned? I forget. What are the other two? Uh, if you're a software now, yeah. uh, if you're a group of two, three smart graduates, uh -huh. that's them. That is, right, yeah. that's that. Family office, uh, right? So family. If you're a solo guy, it depends on what what you think you can do. You know, if you want to be a VPN guy and sell illegal Netflix, there's still plenty of that, okay? If you want to be a service provider, if you want to farm out a bunch of contract guys and offer, you know, internet services, uh, if you want to be a trade, if, effectively, if you want to be a guy who does trading, but just online, you really don't need anybody else. You can farm everything else out. And you can make money the first day, right, with the first client. There's nothing wrong with that, guys. Look, don't be afraid of making cash. Seriously, I've, I've been actually very bad at that. I, I'm a dumbass Korean. You know, Koreans jump on grenades. That's what we do, right? So, you know, I, I've been way too long, way too illiquid for, and I, you know, my family suffered, I've suffered, you know, we, and fortunately we've done well to, as well, you know, but, um, so, you know, don't be afraid of the cash. It's about the cash, okay? If you are a family office person, that you are actually in the worst position of the three, okay? I mean, a lot of Russians will tell you, you know, if you see an entrepreneur that's successful, typically, gross stereotype, okay? They grew up poor, they're hungry, and they have skills. This describes like all of Russia, okay? <laughs> okay? So school's free. And everything's open source, which is why Eastern Europeans are so much better coders, right? They start coding when they're 10 or 11. They get their first real paying gig when they're like 16 or 17. So by the time they've graduated with a master's degree at 23, they've done their you know, 10,000 hours. They're good. They get it. Right? Chinese guy, UST or Seoul National University guy, you know, will start his real hours after he graduates from graduate school because it's not the same thing. And then I have to pay for his education for six years. Right? So family office people, that implies mommy and daddy had money. You went to CIS or some bullshit school here. You were sent abroad for some bullshit university degree, you know. But you're not hungry. And you know if you do nothing, there's passive income because daddy owns 30 apartments or whatever, <laughs> right? For as long as the apartments have cash flow. You live on, mid I live in Guaylo Ghetto, you know, in the mid-levels, okay? There are so many vacancies because the stupid jobs that added no value are finally being eliminated, you know, investment bankers, that stuff, right? <laughs> right? I was a banker for one year. I just couldn't deal with it anymore, right? Right? So they're in the worst possible situation, but they have capital. So I would go back to find other people who are hungry, grew up poor, and have skills, and co-found. Find, find Claire, okay? Find Claire and find guys that are old enough or girls who are old enough who've done a startup or two who so make sure you don't get taken right right and follow take this I would say take the same thing those family office guys know better than any of us here how many traditional businesses are ripe for, re for revolution and the handful that su su survive will own all of it 95 percent look at Nature is a one stand, zero to one standard deviation reality, guys. Okay? Zero to one standard deviation, right? In any ecosystem, in any combination of different gene varieties, zero to five percent move on. 
And when any industry reinvents, it's the same zero to one standard deviation. So for every one family office that kind of gets it and say, we need to reinvent our business, or that guy, I can see how much money I can make if I just do this stuff. 95 of the other ones will be closed. But the products are still necessary. People still need buttons, right? Until you're all naked, until we're all naked nudists or whatever, right? Right? There's so, it, it's sexy. There's no product risk. Everybody knows what the product is, right? There's no market size risk. It's a market already. You're only taking business model risk. So you'll know within months whether you've got traction or not. So if you're a family office person, I would, you, know, you should be able to shoot fish in a barrel right now if you get it and you go for it. Next. Last question. June. Um, June. Yes. Uh, John, question for you about investment. So if it were you, what would you look for in looking at an investor? Like if you had a checklist of what works and what doesn't work, perhaps like passive investors, um, what to look out for? So if you put yourself in the shoes of an entrepreneur, yeah. Okay. Let me repeat the question. Yes. So, you're an entrepreneur. You've got a great idea, great product, great prototype, whatever. You're looking at an investor, and you feel like you have the pick of the litter of investors. What? How are you going to discriminate between investors? Great question. Um, so, I mean, you know, all the books and all that stuff would say, you know, how much value do you add? Blah blah blah. Number one, if well, so I don't know if what you're asking is exactly the same as what you said. If you have your pick of the litter, right? then that actually means that everyone on your short list is pretty good. Okay, so first I'd ask, what sort of brand value does the guy or girl give me, even if the guy never shows up for a board meeting, right? Because the brand is the brand. I have no idea that Google, what was it, Google, what's the sponsor for startup? The global? Uh, Google for Entrepreneurs. Right? I have no idea whether, other than the money and the brand, whether they do anything. They probably do, I just don't know, I'm, 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 I just don't know. So assume the worst case scenario, if you can choose, if you have the pick, you know, brand does matter because look, you know, people don't want to think too hard, right? So if you say I'm a Google something or another, or I'm a Facebook, they just assume, okay, well that must mean, just like if you went to an Ivy League school, that must mean something, right? So they impute value, rational or irrational, on that brand, okay? So that's great. So I think that matters. Um, if you have the pick, your pick of the litter in terms of investors, a lot of it also depends on how much control or how much say they want in your business. Now, I know June, she's a very successful but very experienced. She's a classic Hong Kong entrepreneur. She's done stuff for other companies before. She kind of knows her thing, okay? And you built this business with a couple from nothing, you know, and you put a lot of your own capital into it. So when you do an A round or a B round, if you're a Western guy, they're gonna ask for preferred shares and they're gonna ask for negative covenants and shareholder agreements and things. In the worst case scenario, you've gotta figure out which of these guys are more likely to be a total jerk or an asshole and actually squeeze you out of your own company. There's no guarantee. You never know, anyone can turn and things can happen. Uh, how do you figure that out? You have to ask around, I guess. You know, look, I've got, I'm not a patient person. Okay, um, you know, I've got plenty of detractors, you know, so I'm not really actively investing in Hong Kong startups because we're just trying to make our own thing. Um, because I don't want to go through that, I don't want to, I don't dance for people, right? So, um, but different investors have different networks, different track records from different countries. Culture matters a lot. And it's not the color of your skin, it's your culture, right? I mean, Kevin could have been brought up in Ningbo. Okay, or in Qingdao and could speak better Mandarin than Claire, right? Right, because he grew up Chinese, right? You're Canadian, right? You're Canadian on the inside, you're a total banana, right? Awesome, right? Culture matters, okay? And no culture, right? And these aren't national cultures, they're all you know, regional kind of, you know, like grapes, right? Cultures, right? Nothing is all good, nothing is all bad. You just gotta figure out what's a good fit for you. Right? And you have to understand the language dance of negotiation. You know, when someone says yes in Japan, when someone says maybe in Japan, that means no. They're just trying to be polite. Right? If they say maybe in New York or Tel Aviv, that's, that means they're interested and they're just trying to negotiate. Right? If they sign an NDA in certain countries, it doesn't matter. 
Right? In Japan, it takes forever to get up to them, but with, if they sign, right, even if it kills them, they will honor that contract. That's just what you do in Japan. You put the chop down, and that means a lot. That's not the beginning of the real negotiations. So the same applies to your investors. But even before you get to the pick of the litter, you just got to, you know, it's just reality. Look, when you go to a bar, right? Claire's a, you know, you guys are very attractive ladies. You go to a bar and you start meeting people. In five seconds, you're dressing the guy or the girl up and down, right? Do I want to spend another five minutes with this guy, right? In five seconds, you know, right? And then after five minutes, you got to do, I want to spend another hour with this guy. And then, and then what? Like it applies the same. If you meet quote unquote angel investors, you got to try to figure out is this person a real angel investor or just full of crap? Right? Is the person smart? Not smart. And it's not how is your IQ? Right? Is the person smart in the way you need the person to be smart? Right? If you're in a manufacturing, it doesn't matter if the person went to, you know, Beda or to Tsinghua. Right? You know, it matters whether the guy maybe is a, he's made his money in logistics. Maybe he used to, his, his father owned a toy factory and he actually had to work there as an engineer for, four, for 10 years. He knows. He's gotten his hands dirty or she's got, right? That's smart, right? They're not going to ask stupid questions. They're going to give you stupid suggestions intentionally, right? right? So, you know, so before you get to the pick of the litter, it's about how do you identify where to invest your time? Where do you go? And then how do you moderate, right? Think of each relationship as a venture deal, right? Five seconds is equal to seed running, right? Five minutes is equal to an angel round. Right? An hour is equal to series A. Every time you've got to ask yourself, is this worth reinvesting or do I want to shut the company down? And move on and be per perfectly pleasant and maybe the next time around it's a much better or useful conversation but you need to cut it and move on to the next person, right? And Hong Kong, going back to the real estate question, there is no city in the world, there's no market in the world where the transactional velocity is faster and higher than Hong Kong. You can literally meet 100 new people a day in this city. You honest, I mean, you guys know this, okay? There is something happening in every neighborhood, in every building, in this entire place, because 52 million people come in and out of this place, and it's tiny, and we're not in new territories. You live on an island, right? So don't go there if you want to network, right? Unless you want, you like Josh, right? The ability for you to get very good at, right? And then move on. And nobody's perfect. And just because the conversation doesn't click today doesn't mean you don't have another conversation and be perfectly civil, much more civil than me, okay? Because you want to be that per person anyway because of who you think you are, right? But these are just common sense things. So I, I guess I would just say, please don't throw the common sense out. I mean, everything you learn to be successful and to be mature individuals, I mean, you don't, don't assume that venture investing in people, right? Just because someone says, I love you, or yes, I did the, everything is with a grain of salt. Just because someone says, yes, and if you bring me, I'll sit on your board, and it could never happen. And the worst thing you may want is for that guy to actually show up for the board meetings because he's a total jerk. Right? Be careful what you ask for. Right? What level of due diligence? So if you had a DD checklist on what you were looking for to check out the investor, what would you do? Depends on you know, the, the, what, what options you have and how much time you have and how, how much of the company they're asking for and how much control they want. Right? See, they're all connected. Right? So you know, if you just started out or you really need the money. Okay, so. Well, we just closed a round at Hanson Robotics, and um, we took a risk, and this investor took a risk. Uh, we weren't sure how serious they were, and things were taking a little longer to close, so we insisted that they commit to a bridge facility. It's 30 days, just to see if they would write a check. They wrote a check on the very last day, but they wrote a check. That meant a lot to me, okay? And it wasn't easy for this guy to, to say yes to that. But that was really important to me emotionally, that he would put his money where his mouth is. Um, and so we closed. We signed this past weekend, and we're doing them M&A and all that stuff, and the rest of the round, the rest of the lead round will close, and then all the followers will close after that. 
but it was very, very important. If that didn't happen, we would have just stopped the discussions and moved on to you know, another potential partner. All right, let's give John a hand for Thank you.